Well, hello everyone. I'm Maddie Melton. I'm a student at the University of Georgia. And today I'll be discussing my master's thesis project or a shortened version, which was titled Drivers of Movement and Resource Selection of Wildlife Living in a Protected Area in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is going to work. There we go. Okay, so quickly I'll just go through some background on the topic and then we'll get into chapter one, which looked at large carnivore resource selection, chapter two, which looked at wildlife fence crossing behavior and some general conclusions. So globally, wildlife populations are facing increased pressures from human caused changes in the environment. Habitat destruction is widely recognized as the number one driver of biodiversity loss, which also cause habitat fragmentation, which can lead to local extinctions in the environment. Climate change is also compounding the effects of habitat loss as altered precipitation patterns and extreme weather events such as persistent droughts or flooding can compromise species adaptability to environmental changes and contribute, and contribute to the overall destruction of these populations. Across the African continent, the damaging effects of both climate change and habitat loss are exacerbated specifically in dryland ecosystems, which are of great biological importance. Dryland ecosystems are characterized by low sporadic rainfall, frequent droughts, and soils that are highly susceptible to erosion, and therefore making them subjected to desertification and woody bush encroachment and destroying the overall habitat. Over 60% of African environments are considered semi-arid to arid, and those include deserts, grasslands, and savannas. And specifically, water availability in these areas is highly important as it drives conflict between wildlife, people, and their livestock because these resources are unevenly distributed across the landscape. And with the human population across Africa expected to grow to 2.4 billion by 2050, and the reliance on water will increase to compensate for intensive agriculture and livestock needs. Across the globe and across Africa, protected areas have been established to protect remnant ecosystems as well as reduce human wildlife conflict. And typically protected areas are embedded within a human dominated landscape and are becoming increasingly isolated due to the rapid human population expansion, along with agriculture and infrastructure development. So movement and resource selection are two important behaviors that are influenced by the spatial and temporal distributions of resources across the landscape are fundamental and are fundamental factors in understanding the ecological needs of species. Wildlife populations that live on the protected area edges are influenced by two highly contrasting environments, such as the protected area, as well as agricultural areas outside of the protected area. And therefore, fencing can create these hard boundaries and edges in between these two habitats. However, some species can exploit and survive in disturbed landscapes, and therefore recognizing how species can select resources between a protected area and human dominated landscape can further our knowledge um, and improve the success and, and manage can, can improve the success of management and conservation plans. So therefore, with the increasing human population and the growing need for space for development, understanding the current drivers of wildlife movement between protected areas and the surrounding multi-use landscape may help predict how wildlife can respond to these changing conditions in the future. So therefore we wanted to have two goals of this project were to assess the differences in resource selection between two large carnivore species in an arid ecosystem, as well as evaluate the drivers of fence crossing behaviors by wildlife between a protected area and the surrounding human dominated landscape. And we did this within the greater Atosha landscape, which is centered around Atosha National Park, which is seen there in green, and also a 40 kilometer buffer zone of differing land uses outside. In the north and western parts in blue, you see those are communal lands as well as numerous conservancies. And on the southern and eastern borders, those are typically um, private livestock farms as well as game reserves. And while Atosha is completely fenced, um, multiple wildlife species are able to move in between the park and the different land use types. So with that, we'll move into chapter one, which is titled The Seasonal Effects of Water Availability and Vegetation Composition on Line and Spotted Hyena Resource Selection in an Arid Environment. So large carnivores play crucial ecological roles in trophic systems by exerting top-down control on lower trophic levels and by controlling herbivore populations through predation and influencing these prey, behavior, prey behaviors, they have profound effects on the ecosystem. 
Carnivores are highly mobile species with expansive home ranges and therefore protected areas are also very important to them as they serve as source populations for many different species. However, recent range contractions due to the increase of human populations and the expansion of agricultural land, as well as global population declines due to the loss of prey species from the, influ or from the increase of livestock um, populations have threatened species globally. In arid ecosystems, carnivores typically occur at lower densities due to limited resources, such as low prey of biomass and availability, which can affect differences in diet selection, resource partitioning, and foraging behaviors. Also, the availability and distribution of persistent water sources dictates carnivore movements because during the dry season, prey are typically concentrated around these water sources. And as, the, as we move into the wet season where there's more ephemeral water sources across the landscape, ungulates become more distributed and prey or, and carnivores follow their movements. Two large carnivore species that co-occur extensively across Africa, especially in air, or dryland ecosystems are spotted hyenas and lions. They're both social carnivores, though males and females exhibit behavioral differences. Furthermore, differences in hunting strategies, such as lions that use ambush um, hunting strategies and spotted hyenas that are more cursorial predators that run down their prey and differences in prey preference may further explain their coexistence. While both, while both species have been extensively studied in East Africa, there's been fewer studies that have investigated the impacts of dryland or air or an arid ecosystems on these species. So therefore we wanted to assess the impact of water and vegetation structure on the differences in resource selection of these carnivores inside Atosha. We had two objectives, which was to determine selection at the home range level across seasons between species, as well as determining the differences between males and females of the same species. So we called 30 lions and 19 hyenas from 2016 to 2021. And each was fit with a GPS collar to record GPS locations between one and eight hours, though the average was roughly three hours. And in our final data set, we excluded individuals that were caught for less than a month and as well as any individuals from the same social group. So the same pride or clan um, with that overlap during the same time frame. We constructed 95% um, utilization distributions of home ranges using the kernel density estimation method as seen in the map there, which looks at the spotted hyena home ranges across the dry season. And to compare the used locations to available locations for our resource selection functions, we did a 20 to run ratio indicating these black dots are the used locations of an animal within its home range. And then we selected 20 times that number seen in the white dots, which is the areas it could have been in its home range, but was not. So we looked at distance to water. So the closest distance an animal was to a water hole seen in the blue dots in the top map, as well as we looked at three different uh, vegetation variables. So grass biomass, a woody biomass, and then we also constructed a ratio, which looked at the grass to woody biomass and was used as a proxy for prey habitat. So a higher ratio was indicative of open areas. So for more grazing species and a lower ratio was indicative of wooded areas, so for browsing prey species. We constructed eight resource selection functions because we were interested in looking at differences between species, sex, and season at the home range level. And in our final data set, we had 27 lions and roughly 81,000 used locations and 15 hyenas and roughly 32,000 locations. For my results, for the sake of time, I'm just going to be highlighting certain results. So for this, this looks at line selection for distance from water. And as we see the yellow lines are selection during the day, the blue lines are selection at night, and then the dashed lines are male selection and the solid lines are female selection. So as we see, these are negative sloping lines indicated that the farther away lines were from a water hole, the less likely they would be. So indicating that water was a very, that they had very strong selection to be close to water holes. But we can also see in both seasons between the wet on top and the dry season below, males had typically stronger selection for water, indicative of the higher beta selection, in, which is near the dashed lines. And with lines, we really saw no difference in selection during the time of day. When we look at the selection for the ratio, we see that there's strong selection for more open areas for lions, as we see this very strong positive sloping line. Um, with a lesser effect um, for both males and females. 
except for in the dry season, we see that males typically selected for open areas in, um, irrespective of time of day. Once again, when we look at Hina selection of water, we see similar patterns to lines, very strong selection to be close to water. We have stronger selection of water for males compared to females. However, we do see some differences in slope between um, time of day. So hyenas were typically found further away from water during night and day. Once again, when we look at the selection for the ratio, we see more disparate effects between um, hyenas compared to lions. As you can see with female, lion, or female hyenas in the wet season, we have very strong selection for closed areas, or I'm sorry, open areas at night, but closed areas during the day. Um, and overall, we saw more selection for males, um, male highness selecting for open areas at night compared to during the day. So overall, this kind of means that distance to water is driving selection much more than vegetation structure overall, which is kind of what we predicted. Um, these animals are selecting for areas closer to water for increased frequency of prey encounters and for hunting success. And we did see stronger selection in the dry season compared to the wet season when they're more concentrated at these water holes. But we also saw differences between males and females. And we believe that um, because uh, for instance, male hyenas are inferior to uh, females, they may be around water holes more so to increase their hunting success and not be outcompeted by these females. And also for male lions, um, males typically anchor their home ranges around these water sources to increase their frequency of mating successes as well as you know, be in the vicinity of uh, prey. When we look at vegetation, we see that lines are selecting for open areas irrespective of time of day, which is quite contrary to most studies in more productive ecosystems, and also may be indicative of cooperative hunting in open areas, which has been seen in other studies inside Atosha. For hyenas, we saw much more stronger selection for wooded areas during the day, which may be indicative of where their resting sites are and where their dens are, and also them being more farther away from water to not be seen by prey during the day, but also be close to water for increased success at night. But then also we see that stronger selection for open areas at night, similar to lions. However, they may be selecting for grazing species compared to browsing species. So now we'll move over to chapter two, which was titled Effects of Land Use and Fence Structure on Wildlife Crossing Behavior Between a Protected Area and the Human-Dominated Landscape. So human-wildlife conflicts were, result in substantial loss for both humans and wildlife. For livestock depredation and crop raiding caused by wildlife is a substantial economic loss for humans. Retaliatory killings against these animals that are causing these conflicts result in their mortality. Fence-protected areas are common in parts of Africa, but it's not ubiquitous across the entire continent, and therefore it's left um, contentious debates regarding the overall effectiveness of fencing for these species and has left you know, wildlife managers, conservationists, and conservationists and local people uncertain of the ultimate costs and benefits associated with fencing protected areas. Fencing is not a one-size-fits-all solution because fencing needs to be context-specific and target species or goals needs to be outlined before implementation. And while fencing is costly to put up, it's even more costly to maintain and the um, non-routine maintenance can affect the overall um, positive effects of fencing. Positives or pros of fencing can be seen through species conservation, social acceptance of wildlife for people living near these protected areas, as well as reduced mortality. However, negative fencing effects of fencing, such as direct mortality when animals get caught in fencing or indirect mortality when fencing is constructed and has cut off long or large scale migration routes of ungulates, um, we see that the negative effects of fencing are quite costly. Certain factors such as land use outside protected areas is highly variable and such as the human tolerance for different wildlife species can impact these crossing behaviors. Certain um, fence structures such as mesh and electrification are known to reduce ungulate crossings as seen here with this eland attempting but failing to cross. However, species that can manipulate fences and cause large scale breaks such as elephants or carnivore species um, that can affect the overall structural integrity of the fence um, are, may not be impeded at all by the fence being present. So therefore, because of all these factors, we wanted to elucidate the structural, environmental, and taxa-specific drivers of fencing, of fence crossings by wildlife in the landscape, 
by measuring the differences in crossing behaviors between taxa groups and within based on body size, quantify the frequency and likelihood of fence crossings, as well as determine the influence of land use, environmental attributes, and fence structure on crossings. So we looked at three different land uses outside of Tosha, looking at conservancies in the orange color, game reserves in the brown color, and then one livestock farm in the gray color. And because these are different land use types, they had different, differing attitudes toward different species of wildlife, such as more tolerant for ungulate species, but, but less tolerant for carnivore species on the conservancies and farmlands, while the game reserves has high tolerance of all wildlife species. So we know the Atosha fence is highly variable and it consists of mainly a two meter high fence, but then there's also a veterinary cordon fence along the southern border, as well as an elephant proof fence seen in the top left image um, implemented in high traffic areas. And seen by these pictures, the break type and structure of the fence can vary greatly where mesh is not consistent around the entire fence, as well as break types can range from dig out to seen in the top right broken wires is seen as the bottom right. And then in the left panels, you can see these are large scale elephant breaks. So to monitor, monitor wildlife crossings, we, we placed camera traps at um, holes along the fence and, record, and recorded um, environmental variables that were at each uh, fence crossing site. So each camera was placed on average one and a half kilometers apart. And we tried to capture the different structures and break types at each of our study sites. For the image analysis, we ID'd images um, only focusing on mammals down at the species level, and we signified a crossing event was the same species exhibiting the same crossing behavior within a 15 minute period. As seen here as this group of hyenas is crossing from Atosha into a game reserve. So this would be considered one crossing event. We also looked at crossing and no crossing behaviors as seen here by these wildebeest was a no cross behavior. So animals that were just walking or grazing near the fence also, an attempted cross was considered a no cross where this leopard is trying to cross the fence, but turns around and decides not to cross. And we grouped these species into three taxa groups and also further split them by body size. So we looked at carnivores, so medium, large, and small size carnivores. And we did so for the same for ungulates, so mega, mega herbivores such as elephants, giraffes, rhinos large medium-sized ungulates and then small ungulates which were under 30 kilograms and then we also considered burrowing species such as aardvark or porcupines because we know that they affect the overall structural integrity of fences can cause large-scale holes that other larger species will use later on we had two different types of models so a frequency model which looked at the number of crossings in a given time period across season, as well as the likelihood of crossing. So we took the total number of observations and looked if that resulted in a cross or a no cross. We had different model variables looking at environmental variables such as season, land use, time of day, as well as habitat, and then fence structure variables such as the type of break, if mesh and electrification were absent and present, as well as the number of fences that were at each break. So once again, for the sake of time, I will briefly go through my results. So between Dece or August 2022 and December 2023, we had 84 fence breaks that were monitored, which resulted in over 10,000 camera trap nights. And each fence break was on average monitored for six months, which resulted in over 16,000 independent observations. As we see in the graph here with species on the x-axis and cross ratio on the y-axis, we see that carnivores in brown and the burrowing species in white typically had a higher ratio. So when they were seen near the fence, they were more likely to cross compared to the ungulate species seen here in this teal color. So for the environmental results for carnivores, we saw that small carnivores were more likely and more frequently crossing into conservancies with no real effect on season. As we can see here with this graph with land use on the X axis, split up by small, medium, and large carnivore species and a cross to no cross ratio on the y-axis, we see that large and medium species were more likely to cross in the wet season, but as well as into the game reserves indicative of this dark blue color here. When we look at break type, we, which is the same graph here again, but just break type here on the x-axis, we see that broken wires and elephant breaks um, cause more crossings and more likely to cross for these large and medium-sized species with no real effective break type on small species. 
We also saw that there was no real effect of mesh if it was present or absent on these species crossing. However, we did see a reduction in crossing for large and medium-sized species when electrification was present as seen by this light blue color, which was a higher crossing ratio for both large and medium species um, compared to small species where the cross ratio was pretty consistent when electrification was absent or present. Moving on to the ungulates, we saw that large and medium ungulates were crossing more and more frequently um, during the hot dry season, but season really didn't have an effect on smaller ungulate species. And overall, we did not see a large effect of land use on ungulate crossing ability. However, we did see um, a slight increase um, into game reserves. When we look at the structure results, we saw overall ungulates were more likely to cross through elephant breaks, so those large scale breaks, as well as through broken wire. And we did see a reduction in crossings with mesh and electrification, mainly on medium species. And we do see some reduction of crossings when mesh was present for large species, but that was mostly because large species were crossing over elephant breaks where there is no mesh present. So overall, we saw that most mammal species in the greater Tosha landscape were seen crossing the fence. However, we saw that frequency and likelihood of crossings differed greatly amongst taxa groups as carnivores crossed over 90% of the time when they were observed in proximity to the fence. We saw that structure did not impede burrowing species or carnivores compared to ungulates at the same rate. However, we also saw differences as land use influenced carnivore crossings much more so than they did ungulates. So as we saw that carnivores were more crossing much more in the wet season, especially medium and large species, which is similar to what we discussed in chapter one, as they may be following the seasonal movement of prey during the wet season and maybe crossing outside of Atosha as prey are more densely or less densely um, found inside Atosha during that time. And we saw that um, crossing more so into game reserves as those are representing areas of higher tolerance for carnivores compared to farms and conservancies where they're persecuted when they're outside in those landscapes. However, we also saw that break type and fence structure did not influence carnivore crossings as they're known to create their own breaks or manipulate others as seen by this hyena digging underneath the fence here. Elephants, for instance, are known to cause widespread fence damage, and while some studies have shown that electrification prevents crossings, the effects are not consistent, consistent across, which we also experienced here. We also saw that ungulates were crossing much more in the hot, dry season in order to probably reduce competition for, from superior species when they're restricted to water holes during that time. They may cross out of Atosha to find water elsewhere. And we also saw that medium-sized ungulates were most affected um, by, or most reduced their crossing ability when mesh was present in the fence, um, as these species could not crawl underneath compared to small ungulate species or cross over or break down the fence compared to these large species. Um, so um, mesh may be an effective measure to reduce medium-sized ungulates. So overall, large carnivores represent the extent of resource needs in an, e in, in an ecosystem and are important indicators of challenges faced by all species um, in the protected area human dominated land matrix. Interspecific dynamics between large carnivores and arid ecosystems can differ greatly from more productive or more wetter ecosystems and need to be further studied in order to elucidate challenges that similar or other similar to arid ecosystems may be facing due to the fact that there's unique challenges due to the reliance of water of both carnivores and their prey. And therefore, it's important for conflict management and conservation plans in order to better protect these species from human cost threats to their survival. We also saw that fencing does not restrict all movement from a protected area such as Atosha and into the human dominated landscape, no matter what type of structure or environmental factor may be there. And while fencing can be a tool and management plan, it needs to be context specific, you know, looking at specific target species that specific protected areas may want to keep inside um, the protected area because not all fencing can, can or confine all species. And therefore promoting connectivity through corridors may be a better long-term solution, solution in certain ecosystems. Um, I'd like to thank lots of people that helped me on this project. Um, here in, in Namibia, as well as in the US. It was a large scale project and I couldn't done, have done it without um, the help from all these people, especially in Gaba Research Center and um, MEFT. So I will take any questions if anyone has any.
Thank you.